welcome all to the basic training kitchen today we are going to learn about the first menu in your semester 2 up till now we have seen egg cookery as part of your first term now we are going to talk about meat cookery and to begin off we have a chicken based main course today the menu that we are going to see now are going to be slightly more elaborate than what we had in the first first term the complexity of the dishes are also is also going to increase a bit as it was done in the first year so after the first semester the complexity will increase menu wise so this is the first menu it is comparatively easier we will be starting off with one soup one chicken main course and two accompaniments along with the main course the menu for today is we are making a cream of vegetable soup we are making chicken jardiniere here we are making cream potatoes which is the first starch based accompaniment and we are making a cold salad which is a carrot and raisin salad to begin off when you speak about a cream soup as you have learnt in the first semester it needs to have a base of white sauce and because it is a vegetable soup we will be using variety of vegetables along with the white sauce which will flavor the soup in this particular recipe we are going to use onion carrot celery leeks and tomatoes these vegetables all together will be cooked and then ground to a puree and as always the puree will be added to the white sauce this soup will also be not absolutely red in color because we are using other vegetables along with tomatoes so the color will be slightly faded orange as usual because this is a cream soup and this because it is a cream of vegetable soup which is very much similar to cream of tomato soup we will be garnishing the soup with croutons which are pieces of bread which have been cut into either squares or any, or any other shape and have been deep fried or toasted and we will be garnishing it with a sprig of parsley and with a swirl of fresh cream it is a fairly simple soup as i said because this is the first menu we did not want to overbog you with complex dishes moving on to the main course which is chicken jardiniere now jardiniere is a french word this word when applicable to food represents or denotes the presence of spring vegetables in the dish so to use the spring vegetables we are using fresh peas we are using carrots we are using fresh uh, mature sorry tender potatoes and we are using shallots along with it the chicken dish is a dish wherein we are going to use the stewing method of cooking wherein the chicken is going to be cooked along with the vegetables in the stock itself and we are going to serve the chicken with the liquid that is being in which it has been cooked we will be teaching you basic techniques today and the most important of the of these techniques is jointing the chicken which is a base for almost all continental chicken based dishes we will be cutting the chicken into four pieces four joints two breast pieces and two leg pieces and then we will proceed to cook we will be using the vegetables as i mentioned we will be cooking the chicken with the vegetables so the vegetables will get the flavor of the chicken and also vice versa that is the chicken will get the flavor of the vegetables at the end we will be garnishing the dish with finely chopped parsley along with it for additional flavor we will be using herbs such as thyme and oregano and for flavoring we will also add some crushed black peppercorns moving on to the main to the accompaniment that is a starch based accompaniment the another technique that we are going to learn today is preparing a basic potato mash so the potatoes will be peeled first then we will chop them up into even size pieces then we will boil them and we will dry the potatoes out on the flame now drying is very important i will demonstrate what i mean by the term drying when i am actually cooking the dish once the potatoes have been mashed then we'll add in cream and butter to it we'll flavor the dish with nutmeg powder and we will add in salt to season the dish this is your cream potato and lastly we are making a cold salad which is a carrot and raisin salad the carrots over here are going to be grated along with carrot and raisin we are also going to add celery to it the celery will be finely chopped the raisins will be left as it is or the sultanas will be left as they are the dressing for this particular salad is going to be mayonnaise so we are also going to teach you how to make mayonnaise again we'll combine the ingredients for the salad 
with the mayonnaise and keep it in the refrigerator. Some amount of the mayonnaise will be kept aside and will thin it down using cream, which will be used to nape or coat the salad. When the time comes to plate the salad, we'll use a bed of lettuce leaves, mount the salad on the lettuce leaves and coat it with the thin down mayonnaise and garnish it with finely chopped celery, raisins and a sprig of parsley. So that is the menu for today. You have learnt in the first semester, the first job that you need to do after getting the ingredients tray to your table is to divide the ingredients as per the menu. So we are dividing the ingredients for the soup first. The tomatoes go into the soup along with celery, leeks, carrot, an onion and the slices of bread will be cut and fried and converted to croutons which will be used for the garnish of the soup along with a sprig of parsley. So these are the ingredients for our soup. Moving on to the main course now, we have the chicken. The flavor of the chicken is going to be bacon. So we will be using bacon along with it. Then we will be adding on some parsley potatoes also known as baby potatoes, shallots. We over here are using madras onions as a substitute or an alternative to shallots, carrots. Then the herbs, we are using oregano and thyme. Fresh peas which, which will, we will shell later on, button mushrooms. All these ingredients will have to be placed in the plate. This gives us an idea of what ingredients we are adding into the dish so that we do not miss on any ingredient. Moving on to the potatoes, we need the two potatoes in the tray for making the mashed potatoes. Also the garlic goes in the chicken preparation. Moving on to the salad now, so carrots, raisins, egg for making the mayonnaise, celery which is a component in the salad and parsley which will be needed for the garnish of the salad. Some parsley is also needed for the main course. This is how you will divide the ingredients for the menu. Once you have divided the ingredients, your work as a chef, as a cook becomes very, very easy. The layout is also important. The layout of the ingredients is also important. Whatever you do not need at this point of time, whatever ingredients we do not need will be transferred onto the bottom shelf of the table so that your work space remains uncluttered. We'll be starting off with the potatoes, then moving on to the soup, then the chicken, and then lastly, finally, we'll move on to the salad. So keeping the ingredients that we don't need at the bottom of the table or the bottom shelf of the table, we will first proceed with the potato preparation. Moving on to the potatoes now, we'll first make sure that the chopping board is secure. We'll do this by placing a damp duster under the chopping board. This will prevent the chopping board from moving around. For the potatoes, I have already kept a pot of cold water on the side so that immediately after peeling, the potatoes can go in the pot of cold water. This prevents the potatoes from browning. Also, as you can see, a kachra bowl is kept handy so that all the potato peels, trimmings can go directly into the kachra bowl and you do not make a mess in your work area. When you are peeling the potatoes, it is absolutely essential that no part of the peel remains behind on the surface of the potato. All the black brown spots that you can see on the surface of the potato have to be completely removed out. The potato is going to be mashed, so the appearance is very important. After that, we will cut the potato into even sized chunks. A potato preparation is an integral part of a continental menu. Every meat preparation has to be accompanied by a starch component. And more often than not, potato is the starch component. Today, we are going to learn the basic mashed potato. You can add any flavoring to it to convert it to any other potato preparation. As you can notice, the water in which the potatoes were added has turned cloudy due to the starch of the potato. We will change the water and then put the potatoes on the flame. Moving on to the soup now, all the ingredients have to be pre-prepped, that is processed, before we can cook them. We will be starting off by peeling and chopping the onions. The onion will be first cut into half and then the peel of the onion will be removed properly. The peel of the onion is not edible, so you need to discard the peel of the onion. 
after you have peeled the onions you will just roughly chop up the onions the reason for roughly chopping up the vegetables in this case is because we are going to puree the soup later on it does not make any sense in wasting our time and effort in chopping the onions and even the other vegetables very very finely because we want to puree it later on the cut of the vegetable is not going to be visible to the customer so it does not make any sense in wasting our time and our effort in chopping the vegetables properly moving on to the carrot as was the case with the onion the carrots has to be peeled properly and then this as well will be chopped up roughly you may even grate the carrot the carrot in this case i am chopping it up into rough pieces so that the vegetables cook at the same time the idea over here is that all the vegetables as they are cut in approximately same dimensions will cook at the same time this you have to keep in mind when you are cooking all the ingredients that go in a particular dish have to be cut in similar size also depending on the texture of the vegetable the cooking time varies moving on to the celery the leaves of the celery will be discarded the leaves of the celery also contain flavor but not as much as the stalk so the celery leaves are discarded another reason for discarding the celery leaves in this case is that the celery leaves may discolor the soup the soup has to be slightly orange in color if we add the celery leaves along with the stalk it will make the soup slightly greenish in color which is not desired so roughly chop up the celery as well once you have chopped up the celery transfer it onto the plate clean the chopping board so that you do not create a mess moving on to the next vegetable which is going to be a leek as was the case with celery we are discarding the leaves of the leek the leek again has to be roughly chopped up either you can slit it horizontally vertically and then chop it up or you can just cut it into roundels as i'm doing here this ensures that all the vegetables cook at the same time the thickness the texture of the vegetables do matter when you're cooking it all these things have to be kept in mind when you're cooking any dish moving on to the tomatoes the tomatoes have already been washed up i'm just roughly chopping the tomatoes over here if you notice the size of the cut of the tomato is slightly larger as compared to other vegetables this has to do with the texture of the tomato this is a rotten piece of tomato so i'm discarding it tomatoes are soft in texture they cook very fast that is why we have cut them into large pieces then we will be moving on to the croutons i have cleaned the chopping board and then i am cutting the bread into even sized pieces you can cut them into any piece any size any shape that you want but all the pieces of the bread should be of the same size so that they cook evenly after cutting these pieces of bread i will be deep frying them you can even roast them in the oven moving on to the cooking of the soup we'll start off by putting oil in a pan and along with the oil we'll be adding some butter we want the flavor from the butter but butter as you guys already know has a very low smoke point so the chances of the butter burning are very high to prevent that from happening we always use a combination of oil and butter after the mixture of oil and butter is heated up we'll be adding the onion carrot celery and leeks all these vegetables can go in together we are just going to saute these vegetables we are going to cook them until they soften up the objective of this particular step is just to soften up the vegetables we don't want the onions neither the other vegetables to brown because that will affect the color of the soup once the vegetables have softened up we'll be adding the chunks of tomato and we'll be sauteing the tomatoes as well again the idea over here is not to completely cook the tomatoes in the vessel itself we'll be adding water to this mixture and the tomatoes and these vegetables will cooked in the water so this is a moist heat method of cooking along with the water we'll be adding flavoring in the form of some bay leaves and peppercorns the water has to be just enough to cover the vegetables 
do not add excess water to the vegetables. Now allow this mixture to boil and cook until all the vegetables have completely cooked. The potatoes have been boiling for almost 10 minutes. Now we are checking if the potatoes are done. Remove them out on a slotted spoon and try cutting them using a knife. You should not feel any resistance to the knife. Always check 5 to 6 pieces of potatoes. This gives you a better idea of the doneness of the potatoes. Once the potatoes are cooked, we will drain the potatoes through a colander. Ideally, this has to be done over the sink. Here, to show you how it is done, we are doing it over the gas range in a utensil. We need to drain the water completely off from the potatoes. Then we are doing the drying process of the potatoes. This is a very important process wherein the potatoes will be added back into the vessel in which the potatoes were boiled and we will switch the gas on again. We are making sure in this step that any excess moisture that was on the surface of the potatoes gets evaporated completely. This step is absolutely essential to obtain a dry potato mash. Without this, you'll end up with soggy potatoes, which is not expected, neither it is desired. After this is done, we will transfer the potatoes into a sieve. In this case, we are using a soup strainer and we'll be passing the potatoes through the soup strainer using a round spoon. This ensures that the potato mash is completely smooth and devoid of any lumps. This procedure of boiling, draining, drying and mashing has to be followed in a sequence. You have to follow the sequence to the word. There should be no time gap in between the draining, drying and mashing. If the potatoes are allowed to cool down after the draining process, it will be difficult to dry them out. After the drying, if you allow the potatoes to cool them, it will be difficult to mash them. So this process has to be followed in a proper sequence without fail. This will give you the desired texture of the potatoes, which is very, very important in a mashed potato preparation. A sieve or a soup strainer is a very good tool equipment for this. As you can notice, the potatoes have also turned out to be fluffy, which is because of the drying process of the potatoes, which is absolutely essential as I've already said earlier. Now we may add any flavoring to the potatoes on to the jointing of the chicken. Because we are handling non-veg products now, we will be changing the chopping board from green to red. All the non-vegetarian products are handled on a red chopping board. Today we are going to learn how to joint the chicken. Whenever we cut the chicken in a continental style, the right term for it is jointing. And we will be using the chicken with the skin on. So if there are any leftover feathers on the chicken, that has to be removed out. So I'm pinching the flesh of the chicken and I'm removing any superficial feathers and I'm dipping my hands in the water so that the feathers can go into the water and they don't remain sticking onto my fingers. This step is absolutely essential because the chicken in any continental preparation is supposed to be served with the skin on. 99% of the times chicken in a continental preparation is served with the skin on. So this step is absolutely essential. You cannot skip this step. Make sure that each and every portion part of the chicken is completely clean without any feathers or any residual pieces of food, undigested food. If there is, it has to be removed out. Before this step, you also have to wash the chicken first, which I have already done. The feathers are specially present in between the winglets of the chicken. So that place you have to be sure to clean properly. Pinch the chicken all over, pinch the surface of the chicken all over so that all the residual feathers are removed out. This step, as I have said already, cannot be skipped or omitted. It is a very, very important step. Along the feathers, along the wings, as well as near the tail of the chicken is where the feathers are predominantly left. Also in between the thighs of the chicken is where the feathers are left. So near the tail of the chicken, you need to remove these feathers. As I said, these feathers have to be removed. I am stressing this point again and again 
because the chicken will be served with the skin on. Although in this particular preparation, we are not serving the chicken with the skin on, but as I said initially, 99% of the times the chicken will be served with the skin on during or cooking it in a con when you are cooking it in a continental style. So it's essential that the feathers of the chicken, residual feathers of the chicken have to be removed out because as all of you know, feathers of the chicken or for that matter, any bird are not edible. They have to be removed out before you can start processing the chicken. Any feathers left on the chicken will give a bad impression to the customer. Moving on to the jointing now. When you get the chicken, we'll do three things first. Remove the neck and this is the parson's nose which has to be removed out and the winglets. Three things. So if you are a right-handed, you'll hold on to the neck of the chicken using your left hand tightly and cut the neck of the chicken using the knife. For this, an extremely sharp knife is required. Remove the skin from the neck. The neck will be used for making a sauce. Then we'll be cutting the wing of the chicken at the second joint. This will be done on both the sides. Both the winglets have to be removed out. Moving on to the parson's nose. This piece of the chicken does not have any flesh. It hardly has any bones. So usually it is discarded out. Move the chicken on its back and give a slit on the back of the chicken along the backbone. The idea over here is just to give a slit or a cut on the skin. We we'll locate the oysters of the chicken and just above the oysters of the chicken will give a horizontal cut. So you basically end up with a cross or a plus sign on the back of the chicken. One vertical and one horizontal. Moving on to the cutting of the chicken now. What we are going to do is we are going to cut the skin in between the thigh and the breast of the chicken so that you have enough skin covering each part of the chicken. Give a cut as close to the thigh as possible. We need more skin covering the breast as compared to the leg. So give a cut as close to the thigh as possible. And remember, we are cutting only the skin and not the flesh. Now insert the knife in the horizontal cut, which we are given at the back of the chicken and follow this cut until the skin gets evenly covered on the leg. So you have skin covering the leg properly now. This is how you do it. Then we will proceed on to the move, removing of the leg piece. We will first scoop out the oyster. We are going to remove the ball and socket joint. Hold on to the thigh of the chicken using your left hand and hold on to the carcass using your right hand and you are going to twist the chicken out. You want to twist the leg out, okay? twist it. That is the ball and socket joint. The joint has been dislocated now. We are going to cut the chicken through that joint. That was the ball and socket joint, which I was mentioning. Now we're going to scoop out the oyster. We're going to give a U cut around the oyster, a U cut. So cut around the oyster so that the bone underneath the oyster is visible and no meat is stuck to the oyster bone. This is how you do that. Now hold on to the oyster using your index finger and cut the chicken leg out. Because there's nothing attaching the leg to the body, it comes out very, very easily. This is how you would joint a chicken leg in any continental preparation. You will keep it aside for the time being. To the breast, we are going to remove the breast from the side from which you have removed the leg. So for that, first we'll cut the piece of flesh which attaches the breast to the back or the lower back. So cut it out, give a cut so that the breast is free from the lower back of the chicken. We'll turn the chicken around so that the neck of the chicken is facing towards you. 
and you tightly tuck the skin underneath the breast cavity. Feel where the breast bone is. And just above the breast bone, we will give a cut so that the skin gets split in two. We are not interested in cutting the meat over here. We just want to cut the skin so that each breast of the chicken has enough skin or equal amount of skin covering it. Use the knife to tear the skin so that this objective is achieved. As you can see, you, the skin is cut in two pieces and each breast has equal amount of skin covering the body. Now we are going to remove the breast meat from the carcass. We are going to give a cut on the side of the breast bone. A straight cut is required over here. A straight cut right from the heel of the chicken up to the neck of the chicken. Now when you move towards the neck of the chicken, you will encounter a V-shaped bone, which is known as a wish bone, a V-shaped bone. So we are going to cut ar around or along the wish bone so that very less meat gets wasted. So cut around the wish bone. Make sure that the meat is free from the carcass. Keep on cutting. I, am, I have moved the chicken around so that you can see it clearly in the camera. Ideally, the neck of the chicken will be towards you. This is the wishbone which I am trying to show you underneath the knife. So as I said, ideally the neck of the chicken will be towards you when you are cutting the chicken breast out. But so that you can better understand through the camera, I have turned the chicken around and I am cutting it until I reach the shoulder joint. Once you reach the shoulder joint, you will cut the meat through the shoulder joint. And this is how the chicken breast comes out of the chicken. It will have only one piece of bone, that is the shoulder bone. Moving on to the second side, we will follow the procedure as same as what we did with the first side. We will first cut the skin in between the thigh and the breast. Then we will continue the cut on the back of the chicken so that you have skin covering the leg piece. Then we will remove the chicken leg by twisting the ball and socket joint out. Okay, This is the ball and socket joint. The chick it has come out of the chicken body. Then we are going to scoop out the oyster using uh, giving a V cut. Once this has been done and the chicken leg is free from the body of the chicken, we are going to cut through the ball and socket joint so that no meat gets wasted. And this is how you will end up with the second piece of the chicken leg. This is how second jointed piece of chicken leg looks like. Moving on to the breast piece now. We are going to give a cut on the side of the breast bone. A straight cut as we did in the first case. From the heel of the chicken right down to the wishbone. Once you reach the wishbone, we are going to cut around the wishbone. Here I am giving using a second technique of cutting the chicken. I am just giving a cut at the shoulder joint so that the meat gets separated from the body there itself. Once the shoulder joint is free, then you can just pull the breast meat out from the chicken. This is an easier technique to follow, but it comes with experience. This is the supreme which is present just underneath the breast meat of the chicken. You have two supremes, one on either side of the breast bone. Both the breast will have a supreme. Sometimes while cutting the chicken, the supreme comes out. It's okay if the supreme comes out. Supreme is ideally the tendermost part of the body. Today we do not need the carcass, so I'm discarding the carcass. This piece of chicken, if you notice, is not that presentable. The skin, floppy skin all around, the bones are not that neat. So, we need to make the pieces of chicken much more presentable and that technique is called as Frenching the jointed chicken. 
will be first Frenching the leg piece. So Frenching means trimming off any excess skin or fat from the chicken piece. Then in the leg piece, we'll trim off the top part of the thigh bone and the bottom part of the drumstick bone. The idea over is to expose the marrow that is inside the bone. The marrow will help in the appearance of the dish. Also, if you're making a brown sauce, the marrow will also help in the color of the sauce. It will enhance the color of the sauce. The same thing will be done with the second leg now. If there is any extra skin that will be trimmed off and the top part of the thigh bone and the bottom part of the drumstick bone will be trimmed off so that the marrow is visible. Again, it is just for the appearance sake. The marrow has to be visible. Now, if you want to, you can marinate the chicken. In today's case, because we're making jardinier, for which we require de-skinned pieces of chicken, so I am not marinating it right away. In the breast, we'll follow the same technique, trim off the excess skin, and we are going to expose the shoulder bone. So if there is any meat which is surrounding the shoulder bone, it will be trimmed off, it will be cleaned off. So for doing this, I gave a 360 degree cut, that is a cut all around the bone. And using the blade of the knife, I will just scrape off the meat away from the bone. The bone has to be completely clean. That is what is expected when you are Frenching a chicken. The bone has to be completely devoid of any flesh. Scrape the meat away completely as much as you can. Once you have reached the end of the bone, then you just trim the top part of the bone along with the flesh. This has two purposes. First of all, it will get rid of the flesh. And secondly, the marrow from the bone will also be visible. This is how you do that. If you notice, there are some pieces, shreds of meat which are still stuck to the bone. So we'll make the bone, place it properly on the chopping board and then hold the piece of flesh underneath the knife and you pull the piece of chicken away so that the flesh which is stuck to the bone comes out. The same procedure will be done, followed for the second piece of the chicken breast. These are jointed and Frenched pieces of chicken. Now, because we are making jardinier, as I told you, in jardinier, we do not require the skin of the chicken. I am de-skinning the chicken. And each chicken will be cut into three pieces. Depending on the size of the breast, you might cut it into two pieces or three pieces. Because this is a fairly large chicken, I'm cutting it into three pieces. The same thing will be done with the second breast as well. Remove the skin of the chicken and then cut it into three pieces. Supreme has to be removed out. One, two and three, three pieces, yes. We will transfer the chicken onto a plate after which it will be washed and then marinated. For the leg piece, we will do the same thing. First, we will de-skin the chicken leg and the leg piece will be cut into two pieces, a thigh piece and the drumstick. You need to know where the joint is and we are going to cut in between the joint. So a better way of doing this is holding the leg piece in between your thumb and index finger and giving a cut on the leg piece. You end up with a thigh piece and a drumstick piece. If you know where the joint is, there's no need to fold it and give it a cut. With experience, this comes. After this is done, we'll wash the chicken thoroughly and then we are going to marinate the chicken in just plain salt over here. Because this is a jardinier preparation, we are using only salt. Depending on the recipe that you are following or any other dish that you are making, the ingredients in the marination will vary. Now we will be learning how to make the mayonnaise. This technique was showed to you in the first semester as well. This is just a refresher 
of making the mayonnaise. The first thing that we will do is separating out the egg yolk and the egg white because a classical mayonnaise is made only using an egg yolk. Make sure that the container in which you are making the mayonnaise is completely clean and absolutely dry. If it is not, it may lead the mayonnaise to curdle. Along with the egg yolk, we will be adding salt, white pepper powder and for extra flavoring, we will be adding some mustard paste and to prevent the mayonnaise from curdling, we will be adding half a cap of vinegar which is approximately 5 ml of vinegar. In this video, we are trying to show you how to rectify a curdled mayonnaise. So to begin off, we will combine the salt, pepper, vinegar and mustard paste along with the egg yolk and we will be slowly drizzling in the oil drop by drop to form a stable emulsion. As you already know, a mayonnaise is a stable emulsion and it is an emulsion between the egg yolk that is the water in the egg yolk and the oil that we are adding to the mayonnaise. This is a stable mayonnaise that is why a stable emulsion that is why it does not split that is the oil and the water from the sauce does not split even after storing it for a long period of time. Once the emulsion is formed, you can start increasing the amount of oil that you are adding little by little. Because this is a technique in which we want to show you how to rectify a curdled mayonnaise, I am first going to curdle the mayonnaise and this mayonnaise I am curdling on purpose. For that, I am going to add excess of oil, almost all the oil I am going to add at one go into the ready emulsion. One of the most common mistakes that students make that is adding too much of oil to begin off in the mayonnaise which leads to an unstable emulsion and the mayonnaise curdled. This is how a curdled mayonnaise appears. To rectify it there are many ways. One way which we prefer over here is by adding hot water to a clean plate. To the hot water we will be slowly adding the solid part of the curdled mixture. Now the hot water will start cooking the egg slowly and this ensures that you get a stable emulsion. This is the same procedure that you follow when you are making the mayonnaise that is adding the mixture slowly little by little into the egg yolk. We do the same method for making mayonnaise adding oil drop by drop initially. As you can see the emulsion has already started to form over here. The oil and the water in the plate is not separate anymore. You have to add incorporate all of the curdled or the entire curdled mixture into the hot water to utilize all the oil that has gone into the curdled mayonnaise. If you waste or throw this curdled mixture, you will be wasting the amount of money and effort that has gone into making the first mayonnaise. So it's always a better option alternative to have a knowledge of rectifying a curdled mayonnaise. Instead of using the hot water, you may also add vinegar in the plate and follow the same procedure which you are seeing in the video, you will end up with a stable emulsion. Or you can start off with a fresh egg yolk and the fresh egg yolk, you add this curdled mixture again you will end up with the stable emulsion and the mayonnaise. Or a cheat's way out is to take ready mayonnaise from somewhere and then add your curdled mayonnaise to the ready mayonnaise. That will also lead to a stable emulsion. So there are these are just few of the methods which can be utilized for rectifying a curdled mayonnaise. You should never ever throw a curdled mayonnaise because it can be rectified. Rectifying it will help in reducing the wastage. So rectification of an emulsion sauce is a technique which you should learn from this particular video. If there is any extra oil that will also have to be added to the mayonnaise. The only drawback of using the hot water technique for rectification of mayonnaise is that the amount of oil that is required to make the emulsion increases. 
For making a mayonnaise, a proper mayonnaise require approximately 100 at the most 150 ml of oil. But if you use the hot water technique for making rectifying the mayonnaise, the amount of oil has to be approximately doubled. That is instead of using 100, 150 ml of oil, you may need approximately 300 ml of oil. Again, depending on the amount of water that you have added initially to rectification, the amount of oil will also vary. It may go up to 500 ml as well. We are going to add the oil to the mixture until we reach the desired texture and consistency of the mayonnaise. So keep on whisking and keep on adding the oil when you are making the mayonnaise this way. Also because we have already rectified the mayonnaise, the chances of it curdling have greatly reduced and that's why I am adding the oil directly to the mug. As you can notice now, the mayonnaise has reached its desired consistency. And overall, I have taken approximately 300 ml of oil for making this particular mayonnaise. The mayonnaise goes in the refrigerator now. The soup ingredients have cooked now. We are going to strain the soup through a soup strainer. We want the liquid in which the soup ingredients or the vegetables were cooked as well as the vegetables themselves. The better option for doing this is to use a soup strainer. Once all the liquid from the vegetables has been removed out, we will transfer the vegetables onto a plate. This ensures that the vegetables will cool down at a faster rate. This will ensure that you can puree the vegetables a bit earlier as compared to if you have left the vegetables in the liquid itself to cool down. This is the only reason why we do the straining of the soup. If you have the luxury of time, you can just leave the vegetables in the liquid along with the liquid and allow them to cool down naturally. But because we have a time constraint when we are cooking, that is why we strain the soup out. After straining, we are going to remove the flavoring agents that we had added to the soup in the form of bay leaf and the peppercorns. It's always essential to count the number of peppercorns that you add into the soup while you're making the soup so that the same number of peppercorns can be removed out and you do not miss any during this stage. If there are any peppercorns that are left in the soup ingredients, when you are pureeing them, these will lead to discoloration, slight discoloration of the soup. As I have told you, the base of your cream soup is a white sauce. So we are learning here again how to make a white sauce. For this, we are going to make a roux. A roux is a cooked mixture of equal proportions of refined flour and butter. So I have already taken the butter in the pan. Once the butter has melted, we will add in the refined flour. And because this is a white sauce that we are making, we are going to cook the refined flour and the butter mixture until we reach the white roux stage. That is, once the mixture starts frothing up and you get notes a slightly odor, a slight odor of the cooking of the refined flour. Once this stage is reached, we will add in the milk to the roux and we will cook it until the mixture thickens properly or the mixture reaches its right consistency. Use a spatula. To make sure that no roux has remained stuck to the base or the sides of the pan. Keep on whisking so that no lumps are formed in the sauce. As you can see, the roux, because it is a starch, has already thickened the sauce. And the sauce is thick. This is of the right consistency now. It is coating the spoon. Now we will switch off the gas and this will act as a base for our soup. Moving on to the chicken now, we are going to do the pre-preps or the mise en place for the chicken jadi there. To start off, we need chopped garlic. The garlic, I had already peeled it previously and now I am chopping it up as finely as possible. As we have learnt in the first semester, if the mise en place, that is the pre-preparations for the dish are done properly, the cooking of the dish is done effectively and efficiently. Once you have chopped the garlic, place it on another plate and we'll proceed with the shallots. We are going to peel the shallots, the madras onions and leave them whole. 
these vegetables all of them are going to cook along with the chicken completely so i cannot chop up the shallots if i chop up the shallots they will get completely disintegrated by the time my chicken is cooked make sure that the entire peel of the shallot is removed out once you have removed the peel of the shallots and all the shallots are done you will proceed to the next vegetable which is your baby potatoes also known as parsley potatoes here we are peeling the parsley potatoes properly as you can notice there's a bowl of water kept beside so that the potatoes can go directly into the pot of water after peeling this prevents them from browning the potatoes are done we'll move on to the next vegetable which is your carrot the carrot is peeled and then after peeling the carrot we are going to cut them into dices before cutting the carrot into dices we will first square up the carrot as we have learned in the first semester remove the top and the bottom of the carrot and then cut it into manageable size pieces and then square up the carrot this ensures that all the cubes that go into the dish are of the same size which is absolutely essential because these pieces of carrot are going to be seen by the customer so neatness matters over here all of them should be of the same size cut them evenly as you can notice all the pieces of carrot are approximately of the same size moving on to the next vegetable that goes into the dish which is rather which are green peas we are shelling the green peas and putting them in a bowl all the green peas have to be shelled properly if the green peas are not available you may also use frozen peas then we are cleaning the mushrooms as again you have learned in the first semester we are tossing them up with a little bit of refined flour then scrubbing the mushroom surface so if there are as any if there is any dirt it gets removed out then we'll just dunk them in a pot of water to get rid of all the dirt and we are just going to trim the bottom of the mushroom we want to leave the mushrooms whole we are not going to chop them up the reason for it remains the same as it was with the shallots if we chop them up they will be completely disintegrated by the time the chicken gets cooked we are cooking the vegetables along with the chicken these are the ingredients which are needed for this particular dish as i told you initially bacon is a key ingredient in this particular dish bacon is a smoked cold cut it is obtained from a pig it is cured and smoked now what do you mean by curing and smoking we will learn in the theory component the white part as that you can see in the bacon is the fat of the bacon or other fat of the pig the fat of the pig is what gives the flavor to this particular dish also because it is smoked this particular dish will get a faint smoky flavor as well to begin off we'll first render the fat out of the bacon that is we are going to melt the fat from the bacon we we'll add the bacon to a pot with little bit of oil and we are going to cook or rather fry the bacon until all the fat from the bacon is melted out the right term for it is rendered out once the fat has been rendered out then we'll be adding the garlic to the bacon the garlic will also be sauteed this process requires some time and patience you cannot do this on a high flame if you do this on a high flame the bacon will get burnt once the garlic goes into the pan we are going to saute the garlic just saute the garlic do not brown the garlic after the garlic goes into the pan we'll be adding the chicken to the pan we are going to sear the chicken pieces over here again the objective over here is just to coat the pieces of chicken seal the pieces of chicken in the hot oil we don't want the chicken to brown after that we'll sprinkle a tablespoon or so of refined flour this refined flour will make sure that the sauce is of the right consistency we are going to cook the flour along with the chicken if the flour is not cooked that will give a flary taste a gummy taste 
to your end product. So ensure that the flour gets cooked properly before you move on to the next ingredients. We are going to deglaze the pan using some white wine. You can use any pan that you have. The white wine over here is just for deglazing the pan. Also, the white wine will enhance the flavor of the pan. Because white wine is acidic in medium, if there are any pieces of flour, any part of flour which is stuck to the base of the pan, it will come out because of it. After adding the wine and deglazing the pan, we will be adding in the water to the chicken. This is a moist heat method of cooking. We are actually stewing the chicken in this particular preparation. Water has to be just enough to cover the pieces of the chicken. Along with the water, we will be adding the hard vegetables in the form of baby potatoes, shallots, carrots and the herbs in the form of oregano and thyme. All these vegetables and flavorings have gone in the chicken dish along with the water. We want the chicken to get a flavor of these vegetables as well as the herbs and even vice versa. That is the vegetables should also get the flavor of the chicken. We are going to flavor the dish, the additional flavorings in the form of crushed black pepper. Mix all these things together and allow this preparation to simmer on the flame for further 30 minutes or until the chicken is completely cooked. It is essential that the mixture simmers and not boil. We are adding additional salt to the dish at this point. We will start off with the soup, the finishing of the soup now. We have already made the white sauce. To the white sauce, we will be adding the puree of the vegetables that were cooked. We always add color to white. White sauce is thick as compared to the puree. If you add it the other way around, the chances of the mixture forming lumps increase. So we always add color to white. That is the puree goes into the white sauce and that is done in parts so that the mixture has no lumps or gets no lumps. Make sure that entire puree goes into the white sauce. Once that is done and you have combined the puree with the white sauce, you will strain the mixture out through a soup strainer. As was the case with the cream of tomato soup which you learned in the first semester, this soup will also be strained twice through the soup strainer. Make sure that none of the soup mixture is wasted. Use a spatula to scrape the vessel properly. You have put in so much effort into making this particular dish. It does not make any sense in wasting even a drop of this soup. Pass the soup through the soup strainer by using a round spoon. At this point, the soup is bound to be thick. This is just a puree at this point. Make sure that you have passed the entire soup puree mixture through the soup strainer and all the peels of the tomato and the additional fibers that are present in the vegetables will be discarded at this point of time. We cannot use this mixture again. So it goes directly into the kachra bowl and we will strain the soup second time now. This soup will be strained in another container. This time around, we are not going to put the round spoon inside the soup strainer. We are just going to bang the round spoon on the soup strainer so that the soup that comes out of the soup strainer is extremely smooth without any fibers. This is what I meant by banging the round spoon on the soup strainer. Whatever soup comes out of the soup strainer, it's only due to the force of the round spoon and because of gravity. Keep on moving the soup strainer around so that maximum amount of the puree comes out of the soup strainer. We are not going to put any extra pressure on the soup puree. As much as it comes on its own, that is what is required. Whatever remains back in the soup strainer will be discarded out. Once you have strained the soup twice and you are happy with the texture of the soup, then we will 
look after the consistency of the soup at this point this soup is too thick now to adjust the consistency we are using water you may use even stock for this i am using water in this case make sure that the soup is of the right consistency add water in batches it's always easy to add extra water but it's very difficult to remove water from the soup if you have added extra water to it so add water always in batches once you reach the right consistency of the soup then we will flavor the soup we are going to flavor the soup using white pepper powder and season it using salt i have taken both these in a baba mold and i'm going to make a slurry out of it so that these ingredients do not form lumps in the ready soup especially the chances of white pepper lumping in the soup are high that's why we make a slurry and then add this to the soup this ensures that you get a smooth textured soup moving on to the potato preparation now the potatoes have already been mashed up to the mashed potatoes i'm adding some butter which has been softened up along with that we'll be adding some fresh cream the amount of fresh cream and butter that you add to the potatoes is left to the liking of the chef we'll season the potatoes with salt and flavor them with white pepper powder an integral part of mashed potato preparation is nutmeg powder nutmeg powder gives a very very unique flavor to your mashed potatoes combine this mixture thoroughly using a whisk or you may even use a spatula to combine the ingredients together the potato because it is called a creamed potato has to have a creamy consistency if you want you can even add little bit of milk to this particular mixture combine the ingredients thoroughly as i'm doing here right now using a spatula moving on to the salad now the mayonnaise for the salad is already ready we are peeling the carrots for the carrot and raisin salad peel the carrots properly as you can see the trimmings from the chicken dish have also been kept over here these trimmings will also be utilized in the salad nothing that we use in the kitchen actually goes to waste even the peels of the carrot or in some cases the onions are utilized for making stocks so nothing in the kitchen goes to waste as such i'm using the box grater to peel the, to grate the carrots you can even chop the carrot if you want but a box grater or a grater makes sure that all the pieces of the carrot are of the same size again that ensures that the dish as a whole is much more neater as compared to if you have chopped it up then we are going to clean and chop the celery the celery leaves as was the case with the soup are going to be discarded over here because you cannot consume the raw celery leaves the stalks of the celery can be consumed so chop the celery as finely as possible i have cut the celery pieces horizontally i have chopped the celery pieces horizontally and then i am going to chop them up as finely as possible this is where you as a chef or a cook can show your skill the chopping of the celery and even the herbs is where your skill can be portrayed chop it up as finely as possible once you have chopped up the celery the celery and the carrots can go on the same plate you may even combine them together there's no harm in doing that the mayonnaise is already ready so i'm keeping some of the mayonnaise aside for making the sauce chantilly which is which we are going to use for coating the salad i have used the gloves now because this is a raw salad so i'm using the gloves while combining the ingredients of the salad combine the carrot and the celery with the mayonnaise sauce make sure that each and every piece of carrot gets combined with the mayonnaise 
you may not need to use the entire amount of mayonnaise that you have made just enough mayonnaise to coat the salad ingredients that is enough then we'll be adding in the raisins which are also known as sultanas as you have noticed i have kept some celery and a few of the sultanas aside which will be used for garnishing the salad later on combine everything together properly if you feel that you need any extra mayonnaise you can add extra mayonnaise at this point as well now because this is a cold salad after combining the ingredients together you can put them in the refrigerator this salad can be made in advance that is you can mix the ingredients with the mayonnaise sauce and keep it in the refrigerator i have combined the mayonnaise with the cream to make the santali sauce make a base or rather a bed of lettuce leaves and then make a mound of the carrot and celery salad and place it on top of the bed of the lettuce leaves make sure that the lettuce leaves do not touch the rim of the plate one plate is enough for serving one portion of food is meant for serving one portion of food only so any excess of the salad will be kept aside the thin down mayonnaise that is sauce chantilly is used to coat the salad the right term for it is to nappe the salad once you have nappeed the salad or coated the salad with the thin down mayonnaise we are going to garnish it with the leftover sultanas or raisins and we'll be putting the finely chopped celery which was kept aside we'll be sprinkling it over the salad and finally we'll be placing the sprig of parsley which was left aside the parsley sprig can be optional you'll place the parsley sprig ideally in the center of the mound and this is how you would plate the carrot and raisin salad chicken is cooked now we will be adding the mushrooms and the peas to the chicken also the sauce or the liquid that we had added along with the chicken has been used just before switching off the gas we will be adding finely chopped parsley to the chicken this is how your dish should look like now for the plating take the mashed potatoes in a dinner plate make a round or a mound of the mashed potato mixture make a depression in the center and place your cooked chicken in the depression along with the chicken make sure that you put enough amount of the sauce now because i am handling the chicken with the gloves i can directly hold the pieces of chicken put enough amount of vegetables all the vegetables that have gone into the dish you should be able to see at least one piece of that vegetable on the plate this is again just one type or one way of presenting this particular dish you can use your imagination your creativity to plate this particular dish this is how i have plated the dish in a very very rustic manner because this is a very rustic dish so this is the chicken jardiniere with mashed potatoes if you feel that there are any spills of the sauce on the plate clean it with a tissue plate the soup in a soup plate or a soup cup i am using a soup plate over here ladle it out in the soup plate and you will garnish the soup with the croutons these croutons that i am using over here have been deep fried you may even roast them or toast them i am also going to use a swirl of fresh cream for garnishing this particular soup again the swirl of fresh cream is optional you may or may not use it for garnishing the soup so this is the menu for today your cream of vegetable soup chicken jardiniere with mashed potatoes and carrot and celery salad thank you